Hey, this is Long Gamer, and welcome to Black Sheet Game Reviews. If you haven't been keeping up with the show lately, I made a video letting viewers decide the order which games are review, and we're now on the second most voted for, Layer for the PlayStation 3. You know, in hindsight, I probably should have picked better games for that list. But in any case, the reason why I wanted to go over this game as a Black Sheep is because it's the most unique and last game from developer Factor 5. Before Layer, the studio was known for a few significant titles, such as their work with the Turgon series, Indiana Jones Grace Adventures and the N64 version of the Infernal Machine, and of course, Tony and Friends in Kellogg's Land. Wait, what? Factor 5 didn't become synonymous with Star Wars games until their involvement with Rebel Assault 2 on the PlayStation. A game I did for my I Feel Like Playing series, but since it's an FMV game, it has ages about as well as finding an Easter egg on Christmas... of next year. What has aged better, thankfully, is the Rogue Squadron trilogy, as those are some of my favorite Star Wars games, even with the awkward on-foot missions in the third one. So after those, Factor 5 made a brand new IP for Sony's then-new PlayStation 3, which involves riding on a dragon in a fantasy world and wreak havoc against opposing armies and other dragon riders. At the time, it was hyped significantly as a Sony published exclusive for the PlayStation 3, which still needed to gain momentum against its competitors. But when it came out in 2007, it didn't get great reviews, mostly for its reliance on the 6-axis motion controls, which was something Sony tried and being somewhat original with motion controls, but after a few years they said, nah, fuck it, let's just go back to being unoriginal and make the move. And if you thought the move or Wii controls can be gimmicky, then you haven't played an early PS3 game that used 6 axis. Although most of the time it's just something tacked on, like crossing logs in Uncharted or turning valves and kills on 2. But what game even fully used 6 axis effectively? I mean, Flower was pretty good, and. Um. Yeah, the 6-axis isn't really regarded as a pinnacle for motion controls, and unfortunately, Lair is a big reason why developers stopped using it. Now, despite the reception it got, I'm still gonna give this a shot and not go into this with blind negativity. Yeah, that's my job! Lair! More like liar for thinking the 6-axis controllers were a good idea! Yeah! The f- How are you even here? Didn't you die, like, two years ago in the Killer 7 review? Uh... Yeah, but that was a dream sequence, remember? But even so, you're here as a separate person. We never appeared together. Aren't you just an alternate personality of mine? Well, wait, if I'm an alternate personality, then am I real? Or are you real? Or is any of this real? Or I don't know what's going on! Why am I here? Right, so, that just happened. Let's just get going with Lair. The game begins with a narrated intro explaining that the world of Lair is suffering from the effects of numerous erupting volcanoes. As a result, the people split into two nations, the Asilians and the Mokai, and are at odds with each other. You play as a Dragon Rider, or Burner as they are called, called Roan as part of the Asilian Sky Guards. After going through the basic flight tutorial with inexplicable floating rings, the Asilian spiritual leader, the Diviner, rants on about how the Mokai are to evil and the city appropriately gets attacked by them. It's here we are truly introduced to the game as you tilt the controller to steer your dragon and press square to shoot fire. In fact, you can rapidly fire... fire, making me wonder how these dragons can even shoot fire non-stop. Those must be some pair of lungs. Fire is mostly used on smaller dragons and ground targets, while with other dragon riders it's best to get up close and personal. In fact, there are several ways you can deal with them. You can spam fireballs at them until they die, charge at a dragon and use the controller to slam into them and enter a fight mode with another rider when prompted to, or when you fill up a rage meter from killing enemies, can perform quick time event takedowns. There's actually a good variety of ways Roan takes out other dragon riders, but in terms of the actual context sense of inputs, it's just pushing an analog stick in any direction and moving the controller. The Rage Meter is also used by pressing up on the D-pad when full to enter a Rage Mode for a short period that will let you initiate takedowns and give you a score multiplayer for the amount of carnage points you earn from taking out enemies. Rage is also used to enter a first-person view the game calls Rage Vision by pressing down on the D-pad. This highlights enemies so you can see them better, just like the targeting computer in Rogue Squadron 2 and 3. Actually, isn't it a bit odd to use Rage as a vision enhancement? Because I'm sure releasing Rage is the best way to see things better. God, this whole Zealot timeline is so hard to comprehend, it just makes me want to... <sighs> oh, now I get it. Cool. As for the six axis controls, it kinda works. 
Okay, they aren't that great, which should come to no surprise to those already knew about Layer's reputation. It doesn't make the game unplayable, but it's still clunky enough to make things more difficult than it needs to be. Piloting your dragon with a controller does work in a basic sense, but a major problem is that when you fly into something or into the ground, your dragon will automatically avoid them and disorient your steering. The other motion controls rely on you making gestures, which can often not work correctly, like trying to flick the controller upwards to do a 180 turn. However, the most strenuous motion is shaking the controller to rip things apart with your dragon. And if Flaily Wii controllers didn't make you look silly enough, shaking a DualShock 3 up and down rapidly is somehow even more ridiculous looking. Shake, 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 shake. I find that the main problem with the 6 axis in general is that they expect you to hold the controller horizontally for it to work properly. But the thing is, I tend to hold controllers at a more upwards angle, which doesn't register as well. So my game controller holding habits didn't help with the motion controls either. In fact, there's only one moment near the end of the game I actually thought the 6 axis controlled well, while the rest it felt counterintuitive. There is an update patch that does add analog flight controls you can change to from the options, but even with that, flying remains awkward since you still need to do most of the other motion controls anyway, and the dragon is still fairly loose to control regardless. Regardless. Granted, flying a large mythical beast wouldn't be as maneuverable as an X-Wing fighter, but it still makes the game finicky as the button controls aren't the best either. Like when you have to press X rapidly to fly faster and anything that reminds me of Iridium Runners is never a good thing. Or when you lock onto targets with R1, it causes your dragon to automatically dive towards certain ones and it can spaz out the camera. Which can really become an issue when you have numerous things you can target nearby. It leaves a lot to be desired when the game is haphazard compared to the Factor 5's earlier works. And when the gameplay is so similar to Rogue Squadron to begin with, Lair is often just Rogue Squadron with dragons. Right down to the levels involving escorting units, bombing targets, and even a frustrating stealth mission. Luckily, getting spot in the last of which in Lair is not an instant mission failure. There's also earning medals for completing similar sets of goals for every mission, the profile of mission select screens, the ladder with a narration for each level, having a number of lives, the first person targeting mode, an aiming radical option with the patch, even the flight controls are the same in principle. Oh, and let's not forget taking down large four-legged enemies by lashing onto them. Though thankfully you don't need the flying circles to wrap around their legs in layer. I would expect a game from the same developers of Rogue Squadron to have some similarities, but this feels like it was the only type of game they knew how to make at that point for something that's supposed to be a new original game at the time. I might have appreciated this more if they didn't just reuse the basic gameplay structure so much for this. That's not to say the game is a complete copy-paste of Rogue Squadron, as there are some mechanics that do stand out. Like the aforementioned dragon fighting where you free fall, or more like become suspended in the air, and attack until you or the enemy's dragon go down. It's an interesting take on fighting other dragons, but despite his attempt at the combat complexity of four different attacks and blocking, they don't last that long and give you back health you probably would have lost anyway. So there's not much point to them other than being a gameplay diversion in the long run. Oh, and a couple of times the dragon's animations froze and I was literally attacking blind until I won. Glad the update added analog control and not fix any bugs. One thing I will say that is actually enjoyable for a while is being able to land on the ground and take on enemy armies on certain missions, where you can attack, incinerate, and even bite and eat the enemy soldiers to regain health. You can also get health back from eating enemy soldiers while flying by grabbing onto them and holding the triangle button. But even when I held the button, the dragon will sometimes just toss the soldier away in a rather annoying dramatic camera pan of him flying off in the distance with primitive ragdoll physics. What aggravated me the most in this game, however, is how unforgiving it can be when it expects you to play well, but it isn't your fault because of the controls and how the dragon handles. There are times in later levels that I'll throw several things at once and expect you to multitask and frantically trying to do anything fast and efficient is quite stressful. Whether it's protecting an army or trying to maintain allied ground soldiers' morale by taking care of larger enemies on the battlefield. Add other missions that sometimes don't guide you that well and it makes earning medals difficult to get. Even earning a gold medal in the first missions have absurd time requirements alone. Though earning medals just unlocks bonus content and combo moves for your dragon you might not even bother using. Still, you'd think they would be a little lenient considering how cumbersome simply flying around can be in this game. There were several missions I didn't even get a medal and I earned no gold medals at all and replaying the missions to try and get more and better medals would just be a struggle and not fun. Hmm, only getting a few bronze and silver medals. Sounds like Canada during the Summer Olympics. <laughs> The gameplay may be disappointing, but what about the narrative? Is that at least worth paying attention to? Well, while the setting and mythological creatures are interesting, the story and characters are rather standard, and pretty predictable. Because it turns out the Mokai aren't to evil and attack only because they wanted food, so a treaty is called. But Ron's friend and fellow Skyguard Loden assassinates the Mokai General, the Asylian Guardian, and the Skyguard Captain in one fell swoop as ordered by the Diviner. Then after a few missions and discovering that they were killing innocent women and children, Ron defects but is nearly killed by Loden and he barely escapes with his also injured dragon. He ends up in the desert where Ron starts having nectar withdrawal and gets escorted by the rebels and here's a true side from their leader, uh, oops, uh, wrong PS3 game. Ron then gets another dragon whom was the Mokai General that he held free earlier. Then they run into and save the Mokai Elder who is also the game's narrator and Ron discovers the error of his way 
away and joins their calls to lead the assault against the Viner and yeah, you've heard all this before. It's a story arc that has been and still is being done to death. The game story is still serviceable in moving the game along, so it's not bad, it's just... Meh. Much like Harley Alien, the most consistent good things about this game are the visuals and sound design. For an early PlayStation 3 game, it's not too bad looking and holds up reasonably well thanks to its dark fantasy art style. But one thing that will make you go, yep, this is a game from 2007 alright, is the bloom. While not prevalent throughout the entire game, there are still a couple times it may do some damage to your retinas. Ah, my eyes! The goggles do nothing! Yeah, and it's not just the bloom, as enemy fire and explosions and whatnot can be just as obstructing. Though I did like the level environments that depicted the desolate world and its two nations' distinct features, like the Mokai steam power technology that isn't typical steampunk stuff but more fancy driven. And one level that's the most memorable to me is the Maelstorm, a prison within a dimensional vortex. How or why is this here? Who cares? It's a fantasy game! It looks cool! It's all purple with floating rocks and stuff! It, oh, it seems with everything going on this level, the frame rate can take its toll here. Well, it's the only time I notice a frame rate dip, and the rest of the game still performs alright, even with a few glitches here and there, but nothing groundbreaking at least. There is also the music, which is a good orchestrated soundtrack that is appropriate for this type of game, and you can actually see how it was done from the extensive behind the scenes videos and the extras. One in particular showcases the composer, John Debney, who worked on a lot of movie and TV soundtracks, his most notable work being nominated for Academy Award for his score in Passion of the Christ, and more recently, Super Ninjas. Yeah. Anyway, the music was also recorded with an orchestra at the Abbey Road Studios in London, England, making the music as authentic as possible. There is also the voice acting that has good credentials too, like Robin Ekendowes as Roan and Crispin Freeman as General Atakai's son, Kobakai. From all these behind-the-scenes videos, you can actually tell that Factor 5 did put a lot of work into this game. From the extensive sound effects from Foley artists, to going to the San Diego Zoo to record animal sounds, the motion capture for cutscenes, the art direction... It starts to get depressing to see all the effort these people made and probably showed showcase it here only for the game to not be that good. Though when it comes to things like talking about the 6-axis, you can see how things went downhill. We got the controller, it's great, new hardware, and everyone huddles around the desk and looks at it, and everyone tried it and it's like, this is crap, I don't want to play this. I can't even make a retort for that, the irony is just too much. I'm guessing they either changed their mind or Sony gave them more money to say good things about their system because they do talk about how innovative the 6-axis controls are and being able to pull off the scale of the game thanks to the PS3's blast cell processing or whatever. I do admire that Factor 5 at least gave the motion control technology a chance and utilized it as much as they could, but ultimately it just showcased the drawbacks when trying to use it for a game this extensively. What's also sad is the online integration, which the game calls the Layered Network, which are just leaderboards and a webpage that doesn't even exist anymore. Yay, I love abandoned online features in games like these, don't you? Hmm, maybe the passcodes will cheer me up. After all, the Rogue Squadron games had like, a million codes you could put into, so maybe we could have some fun with... all three codes for Lair. Why'd you even bother with a password feature for this game? You're only gonna put in three codes! Well, regardless, I do at least recognize one. Chicken, since it was a code that let you play a small ATST stage in the first Rogue Squadron, so I am a little curious to see what this one is. Oh, it's just a video showing off their chicken dinners. Did they like them that much? What else do we have? This long ass code for... Hot coffee. Are they poking fun at the GTA San Andreas hot coffee scandal here? And it's literally just a video of a coffee machine making coffee. Hilarious. The last code unlocks the stables for all the levels, which you do anyway when you beat the game. It's like being able to run around to pick your craft in Rogue Squadron 2 and 3, except it's darker and, at least when I selected the stables, only found one or two dragons that don't seem all that different. I'm sure I'll most likely get corrected on that, but I don't really have much incentive to play this game more to find out. I actually wanted Layer to be at least okay, but it's riddled with problems. The 6-axis motion controls are hindering, and even with the added analog option, the game is still basically a version of Rogue Squadron, a fantasy saying that's more unforgiving and just not as good as those games. It's also really disheartening because of all the work Factor 5 put into this and flopped this badly. It's no surprise that this game did not do well, and eventually the studio shut down, after a point where the employees weren't even being notified about not being paid and laid off, no less. I actually feel bad for these people. Sure, the game wasn't great, but there were still some decent qualities to it. And still controlled better than the PlayStation version of Rebel Assault 2. However, in the end, it comes down to the controls and the gameplay, which just don't hold up very well. 
Sorry, Factor 5, but layers shouldn't have been your swan song. Man, I've certainly depressed myself with this game, haven't I? And I doubt the next game that the votes have set me up to review will be any better. Which is Dream of Darkness, Strider Returns. Although, maybe picking on a Bastard Child sequel will perk me up a little. Until then, let us commemorate the sex axis with a representation of Sony desperately trying to convince people it was worthwhile motion control technology. It's just a little dirty. It's still good. It's still good. It's just a little slimy. It's still good. It's still good. It's just a little airborne. It's still good. It's still good. It's good. I know. You walk like a dragon. Can you talk like a dragon? Dance about like a dragon. Can you shout like a dragon? Can you swing like a dragon? Spring like a dragon? Can you give it absolutely everything like a dragon? Can you sing it like a dragon? Sing it! Duh.